Hello everybody, uh, it's nice to be back after a couple of years. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Android Canvas in depth, uh, also uh, in and out, inside and outside. We're going to go through <coughs> how an Android Canvas can be used and how it fits well in the context of UI optimization. So you might have already heard what Buzu is. It's a uh, language learning community. So it's like a social network. You can uh, find people that are trying to learn your language uh, that you already speak, and you're trying to learn the language they speak. So you become friends. You start correcting each other's exercises. So it's a pretty cool concept, and it works pretty well. Let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Nick Shevchenko. Uh, I've been working on Android for the past five years, of uh, three of which were in Buzu here. I spend, dedicate most of my spare time in any sorts of art, from music to drawing. And uh, within these uh, past couple of years, the more I work on code, the more I realize that <coughs> I love working with different animations and drawing. Thus, today I'm going to be sharing all of my uh, experience that I had with the canvases. <coughs> so let's start. What is a canvas? Um, really, realistically, canvas is just a class uh, with a lot of helper methods uh, inside it to draw 2D graphics. Um, all of these classes are all part of the Android graphics collection. So theoretically, they don't really have a name for all of this. It's just a name of the library. And uh, what can we do with it? Uh, we can <coughs> draw different things. We can draw text, lines, uh, different ovals, arcs, bitmaps, you name it. We can uh, do any primitive types. Where and how we do it, we have to provide some uh, x, y coordinates, sometimes also width and height. And uh, how we do it, we use something called a paint class. And uh, you can create this paint object. You pass it to the canvas uh, whenever you have to draw something. And with this paint object, you can specify how you want to draw it, what background color, what stroke, etc. So if you have uh, any button or any other view, <coughs> it's going to look pretty much similar. Uh, that's my beautiful uh, representation of a canvas. You're going to have the view of a button. and. Um, you're going to have uh, the canvas which the button is going to be drawn on, and then the canvas itself is going to be drawn on a bitmap. Uh, let's get deeper a little bit into this. So how, what is a canvas and how do you use it? Uh, so every view is a, perhaps a canvas. Uh, you can access it just by simply overriding one of the methods inside uh, any of the view methods uh, on draw, and you're going to receive the gift as a canvas that you can customize your views uh, on top of it. So. As I just said, every single view is going to become a canvas at the end of the day or at the end of the frame. Um, Android has been becoming quite smart in uh, figuring out what it has to draw, what it doesn't have to draw. But whenever we change some property and we want to redraw it again, we got to call invalidate method on it. Uh, how, does it, how did Android get smart? Uh, since the hardware acceleration was introduced, Android 3, uh, we have some concept called the display list. <coughs> this display list is basically just a, a separate independent entity from the view itself uh, that holds uh, all of the possible instructions to accomplish drawing that view. And those operations are called, called display list operations, also shortened as DL ops. And basically, this is the stuff that gets afterwards gets sent to the GPU thread <coughs> in order to open GL to consume it. Something very important to understand here is that some things happen on the CPU, and some other things happen on the GPU. The CPU is very clever to do mathematical calculations, while the GPU is very fast to process um, different things like calculating where the different pixels are going to be, so it's much more linear. <coughs> uh, in the CPU, we're going to be focusing more on the CPU side, which is basically the canvas, uh, where the canvas lives. <coughs> so before we can uh, create those display list uh, operations, or perhaps canvas operations, uh, we have to kind of understand how can we create those operations. So if we have a look at uh, all of the steps that the UI thread, the CPU, <coughs> has to do before uh, it manages to show, show something on the screen, this is the step that the canvas affects most of um, the drawing operations. So in that step in the draw, we are going to be drawing, uh, creating our display list <coughs> ops. Um, before that, we have a bunch of operations we're going to go through now very quickly. And uh, the last operation afterwards is the sync. And the sync basically goes to the render thread, and it gives uh, the DL ops to the render thread, and then it manages itself. Uh, it basically executes those commands. It gets the buffer from the graphics card. It issues those commands into the buffer. It swaps the buffer with the graphics card. And the graphics then is responsible to draw the different pixels on the screen. This slide was uh, uh, taken a screenshot uh, from an amazing talk from Chet Haas and uh, Romain Guy uh, from <coughs> Google I.O. 2018. 
um, you, uh, my slides are on already on the speaker deck uh, if you want to get all the links. And um, it's a pretty amazing talk. They go through every single step very thoroughly. They explain you why it can grow, why it cannot. But today, <coughs> in order to understand what, why the canvas is so good, uh, we need to focus on the UI thread, as I said earlier. So the, the difference is that I've been hearing, uh, having a lot of different discussions with people. And uh, this, um, I found a lot of misunderstanding in why a canvas can actually be better than layouts. And um, <coughs> why sometimes it's actually better to go the canvas way. Um, and um, we're going to be focusing on these two steps specifically to understand why the layouts are so slow and they're bad stuff. Um, so what are these layouts? So we, we have this measuring layout uh, steps that can grow drastically if, unless we use a canvas directly. So let's have a look at this uh, simple layout here. We have a linear layout <coughs> with a horizontal orientation. We have an image view on the left, another linear layout on the right with two text views, the title and the subtitle. And this is how it looks on the top. And as you can see, I did uh, a mistake on purpose. I basically wrapped the text of the title inside the frame layout <coughs> in order for you to understand how you can optimize your layouts later. And um, so the documentation says about the layouts, they're very, they're very quick. You shouldn't really care about them much. But uh, there are some obviously specific scenarios that we need to be careful of, uh, also with linear layouts. So for example, the, the biggest problem of the layouts is that all the calls get propagate, they propagate in the hierarchy. So the more nested views you have, the more layout and measures you're going to have across all of the view. <laughs> and there's a concept called traversals, which means that whenever there is a measuring action or a laying out action, we are going to basically going <coughs> through all of the parents, um, all of the children of every view to figure out how size of the children can change the size of the parent view. Right? And another problem that we're going to have is that the layout's prone to overdraw. And uh, there is a concept called double taxation, which we're going to go through very quickly. <coughs> that means that the, <coughs> the measuring layout process can happen twice. Let's go through the first one and see how we can optimize it quickly to save our layouts somehow, a bit of um, winning uh, strategies. So the calls propagate in the hierarchy means that uh, we can use simply the linear layout. I'm pretty sure most of you have already used it. We have the view tree, and you can clearly see how nested all the views are. <coughs> uh, the first instant solution, obviously, is to use a constraint layout, which um, helps you out because every view has a cell. They, they have their own constraint solving system to figure out where the views are going to go. So that helps. We'll see how. And uh, the last uh, to fix this problem, you can simply go quickly in the Android Studio to inspect your code. You're going to have a new prompt um, <coughs> in your dev developer tools uh, called Inspection Results. And uh, if you open the drop down of Android Lint Performance, you're going to start seeing all of your uh, anti performance patterns. And one of them, as you remember, the wrapping frame layout, it shows up here. The frame layout can be replaced with a merge. That kind of means please remove it. Uh, the next problem we're going to be talking about is the prompt to overdraw. Where does this happen? Uh, it's imp important to understand that the GPU, whenever it draws stuff, it uses a painter's algorithm. So it draws the, background st the, the stuff in the background first, and then it goes higher so that you can see the stuff that's uh, with a higher uh, elevation for you. Uh, this sometimes, if you end up forgetting to remove unnecessary backgrounds, uh, you can start redrawing pixels. So if, you're, um, if your window background of the application is already white and your linear layout of the, the root view of, um, of an activity is white, uh, you're basically guaranteed to be redrawing those backgrounds um, over and over. So you're redrawing the same pixels for no reason. Uh, how can we fix it very quickly? We can turn on the settings, um, the debug GPU overdraw, which is right in the middle. Um, you click on the show overdraw areas, you enable it, <coughs> and you start seeing a lot of funny colors around the app. So for example, if I just took the screenshot from the documentation, and uh, this says um, that uh, something's going on. So there's a bunch of colors here. The documentation says that there is, uh, these different colors mean that we can start overdrawing different things. Um, so we shouldn't. And the way to fix it, as it just says, is to remove the unnecessary backgrounds. So if you're drawing things three times uh, with a white background, <coughs> it's pretty useless to remove it. Um, the GPU is going to like you very much. Another thing is reducing transparency, which is something funny, because basically Android struggles with the transparency a little bit. The reason why is that whenever we have to um, draw a pixel with the transparency, we need to get the buffer of what color of the pixel was previously so that we know what was the color was before, what is the color going to be now, and then we have to do the mathematical operation of blending them together, and then we can draw the pixel. So if you, for example, want to achieve a gray text view, a gray text, don't use 
black color with the transparency perhaps just actually uh, create that gray um, color resource. <coughs> Uh, so after your optimization, as you can see, things were very, very colorful. They should perhaps look like this in your app. So things are going to be blue uh, or white. Uh, Android documentation says that it's OK to overdraw once. Um, but if you can uh, remove it, then it's even better. I guess it's kind of inevitable to end up overdrawing pixels sometimes, but not three or four times. The last concept uh, for these uh, layouts problematics is the double taxation. Uh, what does it mean? It means that we are running the layout and measure processes twice. Um, the problem happens usually with the relative layout, not usually always with the relative layout, uh, because it goes uh, somehow, um, apart from measuring the views, it also goes to calculate the weights. Uh, so um, obviously don't use it anymore because we have the constraint layout that does exactly the same things way better. Another problem is the linear layout can uh, also suffer of these things. If you're using weights, uh, it's always going to be double to figure out what is the, uh, how the weights are going to affect the measuring of your views. And the same happens with the grid view if you're using the weights. <coughs> so there is not much of a solution here. The only thing you need to look up after is that if your view is a root element or a view holder um, and you end up using those kind of things, at least know what can possibly uh, ruin your um, application frame rate. Um, so we've seen these problems and we've seen already a few solutions. We've got Lint to fix our stuff, Layout Inspector, the GPU overdraw settings, and, and you can do all of that, but there is a high chance that you're still going to be dropping frame rate, and that's not very ideal. Uh, in order to find out what happens exactly in there, you need to use a tool called either Profile GPU Rendering or you're going to use C-Strace. <laughs> Let's go quickly for both of them uh, in order to prove that the canvas is better than layout. I'm still, I'm still on the topic. So um, the, um, as you remember this little thing here, um, uh, now in order to understand uh, how much that measure and how much that layout steps take, we somehow have to somehow, we have to somehow <laughs> differentiate all of these different steps uh, with different colors in order to understand the difference. And the, the documentation already does it very well for us. Uh, we start from the gray, uh, from the green, and we go all the way to the blue. And uh, in order to start seeing this kind of things, you go back to developer options, our favorite place. Uh, you click on the profile, HWUI rendering, hardware UI rendering. You click on there. Uh, you select on screen as bars. And you start seeing this kind of funny things uh, going on, on your screen. There is immediately, you can notice there's three different lines here. Uh, obviously, the green line means the 16 milliseconds, which is your ideal time for not dropping frames. And uh, the orange line, I, I'm not really sure why the orange line is there, but the red line is there to indicate that you're the 32 milliseconds, which basically you're dropping two frames. And um, as you can see, the image right now, uh, you don't really see any of the colors that I'm showing you in the UI thread. And uh, that's because uh, those bars actually, actually represent all of the steps of uh, rendering the um, Android views. So it includes also what's happening in the GPU. And if you are having issue and swap colors going very hard, it means that your views have been already drawn, but the CPU and the GPU are talking quite a lot because you're basically trying to swap the buffers with a lot of operations. But we're not going to be, this is completely another talk. Hopefully one day I'm going to do that as well. Um, so if we come back to the UI thread, I made this amazing, super complicated example with just uh, an image with uh, two text views, as I was showing you before. And uh, we're going to start um, using the system bars also in this application. So here, when I managed, started doing this, I immediately realized, found a bit of familiarity. There is a massive spike in green, and I wondered why. It's just a simple recycle view. We're going to zoom it in. This is what happens. The colors don't really match between uh, the documentation and what the bars are. Maybe it's just my pixel coloring stuff too well. Um, but uh, mainly you can kind of try figure out that since there's no animations or no inputs happening, it's very likely that it's probably the measure uh, and the layout step uh, that are uh, so dropping the frame rates. Uh, it wouldn't be ideal to understand why, what exactly is happening in that green bar to, in order to improve this layout. Uh, so we rely on something called SysTrace, which is basically the god of information of Android. It's literally going to tell you everything what's happening inside from what different cores are doing, what the GPU is doing, what different sandboxes of your apps. So uh, it's just actually um, an app in the Android tools gets delivered together uh, with the tools. Um, luckily, <coughs> the SysTrace, um, it's also, you can basically open the SysTrace in a web view. You used to, it used to, be way more complicated and hard to navigate. But luckily for the devices that are running Android 10 and more, 
uh, we have a new UI tool, a new web-based UI tool called Perfetto, and it looks much uh, better and it's much easier to navigate. We're going to have a look at it in a moment. And uh, if you want to download the traces, all of your traces files from your phone to the computer, you can simply use the Android Bridge and just pull the data. And here we go uh, back in the developer settings in order to get the system tracing going. Uh, we have the record trace on top. Uh, we're going to enable it, and we're going to start seeing the notification foreground popping up. It's going to record stuff. We're going to run the ADB pull traces. And as you can see on top left, open trace. We can open the trace file that we just downloaded. And we're going to see this beauty. Uh, obviously, it's very hard to understand what's going on here. You just clearly see how many cores there are in my pixel. Uh, but you keep scrolling, it doesn't really matter all of the CPU stuff. Uh, you keep scrolling and you start seeing uh, sandboxes of different applications there. And uh, luckily I managed to find my app there. So uh, I clicked on it <coughs> and now it shows you all the different threads of the app that it's running. Super interesting, but we don't really care about that. We keep scrolling down until you somewhat start recognizing some graphics uh, very similar to the app usage of you. So you've been scrolling, you see some spikes, so you kind of remember that. And I recognize this part. Uh, it also has a similar name of uh, K drop bottom view. Drop bottom view was the name of the app of the package. Uh, it just adds a K on it to find out why. Um, so basically, we start zooming into that because it looks like an area of interest, this area of interest. We keep zooming and we start seeing some familiar stuff like activity start. All right, so we know this was the process that was starting the activity. And then if we keep looking forward, we see this little block here and there's a massive block called layout. Hmm, interesting. So that recycle view must have been processing quite a lot of stuff there. If we zoom even more, um, it gets even more interesting. So now, apart from seeing the traversal operation, we also see the um, it's part of the layout. Sorry, the other way around. We see the layout as part of the traversal operation that was I was talking about. But mainly, if we click on this slightly bottom RV on layout, which basically means recycle view on layout, uh, we start seeing that we basically, if you click on it, you can see at the bottom the different details. And we start seeing that this duration was 55 milliseconds. And 16 milliseconds is one frame. We're basically dropping four frames uh, as soon as we start the app. <coughs> That's acceptable because we're starting the app and everything else is happening. But if you already started doing some animations uh, immediately or during, you are popul during populating the Recircle view, your animations are going to drop. You're going to basically see um, um, junky, junky behavior of your app. So 55 milliseconds, all right, uh, we should probably try somehow to fix this. And uh, what if, you can already guess what if, uh, what if we are going to substitute the linear layout with a canvas API? Uh, what if we're going to end up drawing a custom view of a canvas inside that view holder rather than having the layout right here? And it's going to be super simple. Uh, custom view, just with a simple populate method. The model object is passed there with just three fields an image title and a subtitle, which generate in the activity. Uh, we're going to grab an icon for that view from the resources, and we're going to call invalidate to redraw that view. Uh, the on draw is pretty basic as well. We get a simple icon, uh, which is the drawable file, uh, the drawable object that we created. We're going to set its bounds with margin and margin image size, and all of these variables sorry, are coming from the, um, um, from also from the resources, the dimensions. Uh, which I calculated beforehand when the class is instantiated. And then we simply draw some text with the title and the subtitle. And as you see, the last parameter is the paint object I was talking about in the beginning. The paint object, the only thing I've done is to instantiate the paint object and pass it in a set color black. That's it. And then we just call the super on draw. And uh, I launch my app again. And here you go. Before we were at subtitle number three, now we are we're basically almost reaching some title number five. So in terms of view holders, we fixed two view holders. And, uh, and this is only three views on the view. So if you imagine you're, so you have a, an app that with a lot of other hidden views around, uh, if your view holders do any logic or any animations, those classes are going to be super heavy to instantiate. And uh, the more views, the more time. So here we go. The canvas already has helped you to. Uh, let's find out about how many milliseconds. So the um, duration of the linear layout <coughs> was 55. And uh, the, um, the same step layout took 17 milliseconds, which is around three times improvement. You can spend all of the time doing everyth everything else you want. Don't take the 3x as, as a standard of um, 
um, as an improvement uh, measure. Uh, it, it's incredible by how much things vary by drawing using different gravities, uh, wrapping different layouts. Uh, like Android uh, does so much different stuff uh, underneath it uh, that uh, it's very hard to come up with a specific number of how much how canvases are better. And um, as I mentioned before, we also have something new that's called constraint layout. And I figured out, well, why don't we use a constraint layout to find out how many seconds um, constraint takes? And uh, this was a pretty funny result to me. Uh, but raise your hand if you think the constraint layout is going to be closer to the canvas. All right. Raise your hand if you think it's going to be closer to the layout. Cool. I think the layout people won. It was more. Uh, it took longer than both of this. Um, and I didn't really understand why. Like, you have a flat view. Everything seems fine. What's going on? And then I found this amazing article, Constraint Layout Performance. And it goes through different examples whenever you are laying the views. And by laying the views, Constraint Layout takes longer for some reason compared to Linear Layout. Yeah. If you set the gravity to, this, to the center of a view, the layout takes like 10 times faster than a linear layout. So there is so many different scenarios in which the constraint layout is better, but just laying up the views or do, trying to do the same job of a linear layout, no. And uh, if I go to uh, see what the constraint layout has done, uh, it's basically double the time actually of the linear layout, which was very disappointing for this example, but I'm sure in all the other cases, uh, keep using constraint layout because I think it's much better. And, um, and uh, another funny thing regarding all of this canvases talk is that uh, by using another funny settings uh, to show uh, layout bounds, you can start to see around uh, how developers from all around the companies uh, have been laying out their positions have when they add the padding instead of the margin and stuff like this. So you can see how the Android system has been drawing. And uh, by leaving this for a, for a bit, I found out there's been uh, a few apps like Gmail that don't have the views anymore. Perhaps they migrated to Canvas as well. Same happened with Messenger. Uh, all of these view holders, this company started understanding that there's uh, time that we can win. Obviously, it's not as necessary. I think it's more optimizing for uh, the, um, developing countries, much weaker phones. Uh, but as you can see, it was almost three times better for something very simple. Guys, all of this, uh, all of this uh, material was taken from uh, our documentations. Uh, there are some very great, uh, easy descriptions to understand how you can optimize view over drawing profile GPU. <coughs> and uh, now that we've done the theory, we understand why the canvases are so much better. Let's see how we can actually use them. I hope your, your brains are still OK. All right. So this is going to be not as, much, uh, not as long as uh, the previous section, I think. Um, so in the Boosum in the past three years, we've been doing a lot of different custom animations. Uh, the reason why is because um, the, um, the use case, uh, the business context uh, is very uh, unique uh, in its own in terms of there's a lot of times when you have to represent some information in a very specific way to the user. Uh, but this example was uh, a little bit trying to add somewhat a delight. Uh, for the user to speak and this is the example of the speech recognition exercise and the user press the button record it tries to speak and it tries to recognize if the text you said was correct or not and uh, we've seen this animation that was uh, pretty cool we were thinking of doing like the waves of the, what Siri has uh, or just like uh, inflating a button going up and down uh, but all of them were quite trivial and they were not very aligned with our values. So we decided to, um, to spend a little bit more time on it. And we saw this amazing animation on Adobe After Effects. And whenever you speak, uh, like it morphs, the changes colors, it does pretty much a bit of everything. And um, I started thinking about it, okay, like, yeah, we can do that. So I started and I realized that I'm probably not going to start be able to do it straight away uh, by, all by myself. So we came out with... Um, ah, ah. I did a bit of research. There was nothing similar there. Um, uh, it's, uh, it will be quite a great challenge because you have uh, completely randomized things going on, on the screen. And, uh, and everything is based on the user's microphone input. So we did come up with a little compromise. And we decided to simplify a little bit. There's more thing going on uh, rather than keeping the shapes uh, always the same. So this figure would basically go all the way up and the waves would go all the way down. It would recreate it and just continue this animation. So analyzing this step, um, what are the steps of this animation? 
are going to be uh, calculating random arcs around the circle. So as you can see, all of the arcs have a different width. So we need to somehow find out, find out uh, 360 degrees width of all of them. Uh, also, all of them have a different height. So some, some are very small, some are very tall. We need to find a way to draw all of this. We need to find a way to animate this all the way up and down. And obviously, once the animation has finished and everything's done, we start the recalculations all over again. And so every time, it looks very different. So let's calculate these random uh, arcs. Um, so basically, it's uh, I just um, an optimization that I've done straight away is to have uh, an average angle, so that uh, you don't really have any small angles or spikes going all the way up. And I basically keep adding these random al ang angles uh, until I hit the full rotation, and then I have an array of all the possible angles that I can have around the circle. And the way I calculate the heights is pretty easy. I simply create a list of heights. Uh, I map all of the angles to have a random value between 0 and 20. And all of that is multiplied by the voice of the amplitude. Um, I will show you in a second how I get this voice of the amplitude. But basically, if there is, the user is not speaking, and uh, the voice amplitude is going to be close to 0. Uh, if I multiply the heights of uh, all of the waves, the waves basically are not going to move at all, because their height is 0, so nothing is going to happen. As soon as, you, as the user is going to start speaking, Device voice amplitude is going to be close to one, and now suddenly you are having the maximum value of all of the heights. So you are basically inflating, um, blowing up the whole um, the whole animation. So let's have a look how you can actually draw some arcs. And now we are going to dive into how to manipulate and how to draw with the canvas. So as you saw before, there were examples on how the companies are slowly migrating to the canvas for optimizations. And if you expect uh, you're aspiring a job of uh, that caliber, you, you probably would like to know some how, how the canvases work. So in order to draw this kind of shape, um, the simple code is that we create a puff for it. A puff is just a simple set of dots that get created from, um, from the values that you add to it. So it's like basically a line, but it can be any possible line. We go with a for loop for all of the angles. And um, as the first thing we do is that we want the path to be clean every time we draw an angle, because we don't want it to pollute with previous drawings. Uh, we calculate how to draw an oval. Uh, I wrote an oval rather than arcs, because during the process of development, I found out that drawing ovals is much easier than drawing arcs, uh, simply because you have to take care of less variables. You don't have to use the sweep angle and uh, the basically the um, where the angle should start. Uh, where that arc should start in the oval. So the fact that we have always a button on top of this shape, it's going to cover all of the ovals that are under underneath. Uh, it doesn't sound very optimal, but we'll find out later that it doesn't really matter. Uh, so let's continue here. We create our oval. Uh, we'll have a look how we can create that oval. And uh, we add it to the path. And something that's going to happen here is that we need to calculate a rotation angle. And uh, we're going to rotate the canvas for a specific reason now. And I'm going to demonstrate it with a few examples right here. So the biggest caveat of uh, the canvas is that whenever you're drawing a novel or you're drawing a line, there is no way to rotate that in anyhow. What you got to do is that you need to rotate the whole canvas. And uh, so you, we can draw the ovals only vertically. And um, now that we drew this oval on this line, um, in order to draw the next oval, we need to basically somehow rotate that canvas. So the next iteration of the angles, we're going to rotate it. We're going to draw it again. So now we suddenly have two petals. Uh, we need to go all the way up there. And the rotation angle, uh, as you see here, it's taken into consideration of the current and the future angle. Um, and this is this exact angle. So as you can see, because the width of the oval, those ovals can be different, we need to take into account half of the previous and half of the current, or in my case, I did the future or, in, or the current. And <clears throat> this is how we end up drawing the ovals all around the arc. Uh, how do we actually get to draw those ovals? Uh, we'll see in a second. What I've done here was that after switching the arcs to ovals, and um, Creating the paint, this is the shape that you've seen that I've done uh, with uh, just by rotating the canvas 360 degrees and drawing always the same arc. Uh, this is the example of how the paint object can change your shape. So this is the style that I just put this style as a stroke to this shape. 
And this is how I decided to draw ovals. It looks something like this. So now if I do the set style fill of the paint, we're going to be coloring them inside. So now if I put the button on top, it's going to look almost similar to the original shape that we've been doing before. And um, as you saw, initially this was the shape. And uh, it had three layers. Uh, the external one was lighter all the way um, inside. It was uh, getting darker. How do we do that? So, um, obviously, we do a for loop. From uh, layer n, we go f uh, there's a bit of Kotlin. So we go from three down to one, three to one. So we do three layers. And uh, there is. Um, uh, there's uh, these two operations that I use in here, which is the canvas save and canvas restore. In between them, I call the draw one layer of arcs, which is the method we've seen before of when I rotated the canvas all around 360 degrees. And, and basically, if the layer N is not one, we are going to end up drawing a circle. Uh, that's mainly to cover the areas of when the ovals are intersecting. So. Um, you're going to have, uh, you're going to draw all your ovals and then you're going to draw a circle on top to cover all the intersections inside it. And, um, and the final effect is going to be like the waves are going to be starting out from that oval. So every layer has a um, waves and oval, waves and oval, waves and oval, uh, until we reach the white oval all the way in front. So because um, every time we go inside the draw one lay layer of arc, um, because we rotated the canvas by a set of degrees, sometimes it it happened to me that, that my algorithm to figure out 360 degrees wasn't working properly, and sometimes I wasn't ending up with 360 degrees all the time. And every time we need to redraw a new layer, we need to make sure that all of the positions of all of the three layers are going to be aligned together. And uh, the canvas uh, rotation operation is one of the manipulation techniques of the canvas. In order to restore the canvas as it was originally before, in the beginning of the drawing, I need to call the save method. So that stores how the canvas looked like. We can rotate it as much as we want. And then we call restore, and the canvas gets uh, back in its own place. Don't worry uh, about the drawings. So it doesn't reset the drawing part. It's only, it only resets the operation on the canvas. And after I've done the three layers, uh, this is something that started uh, appearing on the screen. Um, as you can see at this stage, I did not have the average angle. In fact, like on the right here, we have uh, massive small angles, uh, almost spikes. So we decided to get rid of that. And uh, the way I draw the oval size, which is the final more complicated part, is that an oval just requires four parameters, left, top, right, bottom. Now, uh, I had the angle uh, of uh, the, initial, uh, the initial angle, <coughs> and I know that I can draw the ovals only vertically. So here we can simply apply the math sin operation to find out the intersection with the circle of where that uh, left value is. And uh, this is how it's going to look like all together. So initially in the angle size, we, as you remember, we reset the path. We get our angle at our delta, delta height. Uh, we are going to calculate that specific red point uh, using the angle in radians, and we are going to transform the half of the angle in radians in the scene and transform it into a float. And then we have suddenly the position of the right. The left position, as you can imagine, is just the mirror of the right. And here is how we set all of the values to this oval. And uh, the top one is center x uh, plus angle offset, which is basically right and left uh, whenever you see the x. And uh, whenever there's y, we're talking about the height. So the second value, center y, the longest one, is the one that decides the actual height, how tall that goes. So we have something called the temporary radius, because obviously the radius changes depending on which layer you are. And uh, this wave radius offset uh, variable is the one, basically, that is going to affect how tall that um, oval becomes. And this depends on the amplitude of the microphone of the user. And uh, later we go on to figure out how, by how much we need to rotate the canvas in the next iteration. And uh, we adapt the half of the current angle, angle divided by 2. And then we find if there's any angles in the array, uh, we also adapt the next angle. So we rotate it by that. We add the oval to the path. We customize the wave painter with a specific color that we want. So the bigger the end, the lighter it is. We draw the path. And, um, and then we keep reiterating on this until we complete. Um, and this is basically how we draw all the ovals all around it. So in the beginning, when I was developing this, I was very afraid that it would have been way too many operations. But at the end, we'll find out that it wasn't like that at all. So where are we now? So we did some random arcs. We did the random height of each arc. Uh, we drew a white circle on top. Uh, we suddenly now we have the three layers uh, with different colors. 
And uh, now let's add the actual animation. So at that point, I had the shape like that. It was static, it wasn't moving at all. And uh, as you can expect, the animation was just a simple value animator uh, that goes directly from 0 to 10 and from 10 to 0. So it goes from 0 to 10, from 10 to 0. And uh, on repeat, which is highlighted in uh, red, uh, whenever this animation ends, we recalculate the whole thing all over again, and the shape looks completely different. And this is the result that I came up by the end. So this was completely animating constantly. And um, I was a bit suspicious that this thing is not going to work at all, because it looks very weird. And um, I don't know how this could possibly give you the impression that you're talking. But um, um, at the end, we started doing uh, the iterations. Um, so when I added uh, the microphone, um, I think I forgot the picture of the what happened. So basically, it was, um, oh, you'll see it in the iterations. So something that uh, I came up to the conclusion after doing this project is that um, it's very, very important to whatever you're doing a new design feature, uh, the iterations are probably the part that's going to make this feature unique. Uh, you can implement it the way it looks like in Zeppelin or Sketch, but whenever you start using it, it's a completely different thing <coughs> whenever it starts actually working. And uh, the reiteration for this project was the key to, to achieve a somewhat um, a pleasurable uh, result. And uh, all of these reiterations usually pay off. So what we, start, we started changing pre pretty much completely uh, what we thought in the beginning. We decided to add, uh, rather than animating everything at the same time, we decided to add just one massive dominant and two subordinates. Um, in, this, um, in this way, it would kind of give you a sense of control, what's going on. You, you don't have to look everywhere, you just look at one place. And then we added the microphone, um, which obviously I have done earlier. Uh, but this is kind of uh, like it looks, so this is me speaking and I will just blow in different things. Um, trust me, with uh, this, um, with this um, dominant, uh, it was getting much better than everything just blowing up all together at the same time. And um, the way I get the microphone value is that I use a media recorder. Uh, you just simply instantiate it. Uh, the media recorder has a getter on it, get amplitude. And, uh, and that's it. If you run a handler every, every frame, or you can do it every two frames, uh, you basically get that uh, amplitude value. You, you send it to your animation. You call invalidate. And with that value, basically, the whole shape is going to keep recreating. Another thing that we've done is that we added the alpha and the gradients. So as you can see now, um, you have, have different shapes coming up from different circles. And we've done something quite tricky. Basically, uh, you still have all of the three layers of circles that you can see here. The, you can clearly see the different layers here. Uh, but what we've done is that basically that blue, light blue, uh, slightly light blue, not the super light blue, the slightly light blue, um, we color the circle with a gradient. And we start the gradient from the edge of the white with that color, but going towards the, the external uh, light, light blue, we are going to be using the gradient to basically fade into the next circle. So every circle is fading into the next circle. That's why it looks like it's all just one big circle. In reality, it's free. And all of the different waves are coming from whenever they need to come out from. So it was also already a bit better. And uh, something then we decided to do is that uh, to make it a bit less like drum and bass animation. Uh, so we wanted to make it slightly slower and also give a bit of more life. So whenever the speaker would be, whenever the user would be speaking, we also decide to color a bit darker. And to do that, I also use a simple value animator. I have two sets of my color, uh, the lighter colors and the darker colors. And then I have a final list that is basically the list that the animation should be using. Uh, whenever we have a high Amplitude, I simply animate all of the color values from one set to the other and assign it into the final list and just get all of the colors from that final list. And that's it. And then we shipped it, and then uh, we got some great feedback. Um, and I'm having a talk about it. So everything was cool. But um, what about that performance things that we were talking about? How is this going to affect how an animation of this kind of caliber affects the GPU? Well, guess what? It was absolutely nothing all the way lower than the 16 milliseconds. I found out it was a little bit of uh, red stuff and yellow stuff there going on. And as I said earlier, it means that the CPU uh, is all right, uh, is not doing uh, not much at all regarding animations or inputs. Uh, it already drew everything it needs. All the red stuff means that there are 
the CPU and the GPU are struggling, they are communicating a bit way too much, means that the display list operations that we talked about earlier are too long. And uh, the way to do that is that we need to somehow um, optimize the display list operations. So for that purpose, I've done a few things. I firstly optimized how I restore and save the canvas. Uh, by that, I just mean that I moved to the places. So I used to basically create, um, I used to save and restore the canvas every time we would do um, a rotation. And I would restore it. I would calculate the angle. I would rotate. I would restore it. And now I put it outside that loop. So now we simply just rotate it uh, for 360 degrees. And then also I removed all, all of the possible initialization of any variable. Uh, so all of the variables are, became class variables. And the result was uh, unexpectedly low uh, like that. So, so we were fine. To remember, last things to remember, and then I'm going to leave you to have more <laughs> beer. Uh, don't allocate memory in on draw, as I said. Perhaps just move all of your variables on the top of the class <coughs> and simply assign them, and uh, your on draw method is going to be way faster. The preview uh, in Android Studio works even with custom views. So, yeah, it actually does. With um, If you just need to compile the code, once it compiles, the preview understands that uh, this is something custom. I'm going to draw it. I'm going to run the code through on draw because the only reason why you see the buttons on the preview is because that thing is going to on draw method. And uh, sometimes you actually don't see the stuff uh, in the preview when you have a custom view. And that's mainly because um, the view is not really um, alive yet. So what you can do is that you need you can mock some values. So you can give it already some values, for example, the amplitude of the voice. So if uh, in, the, in your constructor of the custom view, you can have the if it's in edit mode, um, just a Boolean. And the, the system, the preview will figure out, OK, so we are just having the preview here. Uh, I'm going to assign these um, values to these variables, and then I'm going to go and draw, and you suddenly see the shape appearing. Uh, another thing that obviously going custom, you are forgetting, you are, we are not dro we are dropping, is the accessibility helpers that Google has already fought for us. So whenever you have a text view or a button, uh, whenever the blind person is going to be uh, um, using the screen, um, this the system that keeps saying what they're saying from top to bottom. If your custom view doesn't uh, is not accessibility friendly, the uh, Android system is not going to pick that view as a as a view, as a real view. So it's not going to say anything about it. So you might, if it's like a button, which you have to press, uh, they might not know that there is a button there. To fix it, you use something called set content description, and you just pass a string, and then the system is going to pronounce that your view is in the screen. And the last thing I want to say is uh, don't really canvas everything. As in, <clears throat> as you saw, the canvas can increase the, your performance quite a lot if, if you have a lot of logic going on in your Osarka view. So if you start dropping frames there, yes, you use it. It's fine. And also for the business cases, whenever you have some information that will be very cool to show in a very custom way and make your app unique, it, I think it's a good time to take the canvas. So thanks for listening. The last, 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 I promise, last things <laughs> I'm going to say is to embrace your custom drawing. Uh, I think it's great. I think Android ecosystem is very behind with that. Um, I can hear that every year by Nick Butcher, who is like the ambassador of animation, saying that we need to do more of this kind of stuff. And for this reason, I published uh, the, uh, first of all, I published the speaker deck. Uh, and I also published uh, the code. Uh, of the speech wave animation on GitHub, which is public. You can go have a look how, I, how it actually works uh, or use it in your app if you want. And uh, the last thing is they come work with us. We are hiring a fourth Android engineer. Uh, it will be great if you joined us. And uh, for, who knows, more custom drawing. <laughs> have a great evening and thank you, guys.